Good afternoon, everyone. What an historic day. The flag of the Ho-Chunk Nation flies above basketball. It's my distinct honor and pleasure today to introduce Dr. Claire Marie Hefner, one of the most important American scholars studying Islam in Indonesia from an anthropological perspective. Her contributions to the study and understanding of gender, leadership, and education especially have already enriched the field significantly. I can't wait to read your new book, Achieving Islam, Women, Piety, and Moral Play in Indonesian Muslim Boarding Schools just as soon as Princeton publishes it. I feel like I just keep missing Claire for the last decade or more, just one step behind her. I come to Madison to teach, she just left. I go to the Muhammadiyya school in the Kalma neighborhood of Jogja with my kid. We get mobbed by kids. We talk a little bit about composting the Kalpataro Prize, but mostly we're talking about Makle. <laughs> All my friends, it seems, teach at Emory. I was just there last month and we talked about Claire Marie Hefner. I've seen her dance at Siasi and read and admired her work for a long time. And now I'm so pleased to be able to introduce her at UW-Madison, her alma mater. Dr. Claire Marie Hefner received her BA in Cultural Anthropology and Southeast Asian Studies here at Madison. And like so many of us, she learned Southeast Asian languages here too at Siasi. Her PhD is from Emory University in Sociocultural Anthropology. She's long been doing field work on Islamic boarding schools, women and gender in Java, and has been recognized with a prestigious and coveted Wintergren postdoc this year, not her first Wintergren, I might add, in addition to having won an NSF, a Spencer Fellowship, and a Fulbright. She's currently a visiting research scholar in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Fordham in New York. I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Claire Marie Hefner. The title of her talk today is Morality, Religious Authority, and the Muslim Edge, Indonesian Muslim Schoolgirls Online. Please join me in warmly welcoming her back to Ingram Park. Thank you so much, Anna, for that incredibly generous and warm uh, welcome and introduction. I really appreciate it. That's so sweet. Um, I, too, feel like we keep missing each other, and just that this is a nice time for us to both finally uh, intersect here um, at uh, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Um, it's been a delight to be back on campus after 10 years um, since I was last here for CSE. Um, I want to thank uh, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, um, Dr. Ian Baird, Dr. Mike Cullinane, and Dr. Mary McCoy in particular for um, you know, coordinating everything to get me here today. Um, and it's, it's been uh, just a really wonderful return. Um, so my presentation today is part of a broader project, um, as Anna was describing, that is, uh, I've been doing in these schools in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, for a while now. So I started to attend these schools in 2008, um, and this ethnographic study has kind of transformed and expanded into a longitudinal study um, as I followed the lives and trajectories of a select group of um, alumna from the two schools of my study that you'll be hearing about today. Um, this broader project is on women's achievement and moral learning in these Islamic boarding schools for girls. Um, the Indonesian word for an Islamic boarding school for girls is pesantren, so you'll hear me use that term uh, a few times throughout my presentation today. Um, so, without further ado, I'll start us off um, on, with my talk. Um, and as, uh, as a, any good anthropologist will do, I, I like to start with a little bit of ethnography. So we're going to start with Yulia's story. So Yulia is a bright 23-year-old woman with a talent for language and aspirations to study abroad. We first met during my dissertation fieldwork between 2011 and 2013, when she was in her penultimate year at the Santen Krapia Alimaksum in Jogjakarta. Yulia was 15 at the time and in the Islamic Studies track in the school, in the high school particularly. I regularly sat in on her class where she could be found wearing bright red headphones over her white uniform headscarf, transcribing and translating Taylor Swift lyrics between classes. In uh, 2019, she graduated from the prestigious Universitas Gajamada in Jogjakarta with a degree in international relations. During her studies at university, she served as a dorm supervisor at her alma mater and continued her studies of the Quran and Islamic sciences. Yulia's father passed away several years ago, and since then, Yulia's mother back home has felt some pressure to take on her late husband's role as the religious guide for the family. 
During our interview in 2019, Yulia mentioned how she sometimes gets frustrated by the influence that WhatsApp groups have had on her mother, who has no formal Islamic schooling herself, at least not in the same way that Yulia does. Yulia told a story about a recent family vacation where she'd been listening to some pop music, and her mother scolded her, saying, ah, so you have time to listen to music, but what about the Quran? Yulia commented to me, saying, okay, I mean, sure, I listen to the Quran every day, but not like all the time. The irony of this exchange is that in boarding at the Islamic school, Yulia has regular exposure to the Quran, and as a young woman deeply committed to Islam, she also regularly chooses to read the holy book on her own. When I asked Yulia where she thought her mother's new attitude towards religious piety came from, Yulia told me she suspected it was the new preachers her mother was following online, or the content that her mom's friends were sending her on social media. Quote, sometimes she forwards me religious memes, like ones claiming that Cadbury and Doritos are haram, or forbidden according to religious law. And I think, okay, well then, what about those halal seals of approval on the package, saying they're religiously acceptable? I asked Yulia what, if anything, she says to her mom on these occasions. She explained, I try to gently remind her, hey mom, be sure to check the sources on those materials before clicking send. But Ibu Ibu, or moms, older women, they'll just forward anything. So my pre presentation today is an analysis of internet access, digital literacy, and debates about morality in the context of two well-regarded Indonesian Islamic boarding schools for girls. In urban Indonesia, the smartphone has become a central fixture on the social landscape. The ubiquity of digital technology has been heralded by some scholars and social commentators as a great democratizing force and an important catalyst for social change, claims that we could maybe kind of challenge or question a little. Within the study of Islam, internet access is credited with having allowed for a greater number and range of participants in debates about proper religious forms and practice across the Ummat, or the global Muslim community a process that anthropologists Dale Eichelman and John Anderson have referred to as the fragmenting of religious authority. Yet many Indonesian cultural observers, political officials, and religious leaders have raised concerns about the moral dangers of uncens uncensored internet content and the addictive nature of social media consumption practices. And on this slide here, um, you can see some examples from Instagram, po Instagram posts raising such concerns um, from various organizations that I can talk about a little bit more later. Um, so with the rise in prominence of neo-Salafi and even radical Islamist groups online and on the Indonesian political landscape, these phenomena raise critical questions regarding shifts in forms of religious authority and the practice of Islam. In the words of a traditionalist Kiai, or male leader of Pesantren, during new student orientation in 2019, quote, a cell phone is like a knife. If students don't know how to use it properly, they just end up hurting themselves, end quote. Many educators view digital technology as a powerful and necessary tool, but a dangerous one if handled incorrectly by the user. Indonesian Pesantren, or Islamic boarding schools, are traditionally located in rural settings, set apart from cities and towns, and often situated great distances from students, friends, and families. Access to the internet, cell phones, and social media in these schools is either limited or more often non-existent. Parents and teachers see such restrictions as disciplinary tools meant to protect students from the moral dangers of modern life, most commonly identified as free socializing between boys and girls, premarital sex, often known as free sex in Indonesia, and accessing drugs and alcohol. In recent years, however, the alluring glow of internet-capable cell phones, computers, and tablets have been added to the list of parental anxieties. Religious training is seen as the antidote. When I asked one mother her reason for boarding her children in, in the Pesantren, she explained, quote, if they stay at home, they'll just play on their smartphone all day, inshallah, or Allah willing. Instead, here, they'll learn proper Islam, or Islam yam baik dan benar. Islamic boarding schools located in urban areas are less common than their rural counterparts, but this is changing. Um, many Muslim boarding and day schools are now opening in cities and towns in response to the desires of urban middle-class families who are committed to educating their children in the Islamic sciences along with the national curriculum. So the two schools of my study, uh, Madrasa Mu'alima Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, or Mu'alima, and Pesantren Krapia Ali Maksum, or Krapia, are based, um, urban-based Islamic boarding schools 
that cater to lower middle and middle class families. They both offer six year programs for middle school through high school. The school's glossy informational brochures boast top of the line facilities, including language laboratories with rows of computers and libraries with internet access. In urban schools like these, computers and internet access are increasingly requirements for modern institutions hoping to remain competitive as they serve middle class Indonesian Muslim youth with aspirations for university education and white collar careers. So for my presentation today, I'm gonna to analyze the peripheral yet critical digital edge as I call it, that some young women students and recent alumna cultivate through experiences online, their moral training, and their socialization with peers. So here I'm borrowing and reshaping the term digital edge from the Watkins et al. 2018 study of electronic media use um, of lower, uh, lower income black and Latino students in an American high school in Texas. Watkins et al. found that students' use of technology reflected their disadvantaged position as peripheral internet users, which, was, which uh, was a result of students often owning out of date devices and having limited internet access. The study also revealed, however, that students employ remarkably innovative strategies in their digital consumption patterns. So my use of the digital edge highlights the contradictory contours of digital life among Indonesian Muslim boarding school girls. Digital media and internet use in Islamic schools, if allowed at all, is often limited and subject to strict restrictions. At both Mu'alimat and Krapyak, unsupervised internet use is prohibited on school grounds and any gadgets, including laptops, tablets, and cell phones, are considered contraband and swiftly confiscated by school officials. Some young women felt that this left them vulnerable to being hopelessly out of touch or left behind by the times. However, despite these limitations, Mu'alima and Krapiat students are creative and daring in their efforts to bend the rules of the school to gain internet access and to quickly adapt their media ideologies or their cultural beliefs about media and mediation um, to the latest platforms and applications. The limited internet access that Mualima and Krapia grant their students gave them a digital edge over their less modern, as they called them, or kuran moderen, or kuno, or uncool, patro, peers, as they, as they saw them, at Islamic schools where internet and computer access of any kind is typically not allowed or simply not available. Knowledge of and access to the internet in Indonesian Muslim boarding schools has become an important element of status distinction, or gangsi, and cosmopolitan style. Now, departing from Watkins et al.'s study and their use of the word digital edge, I'm using the term um, here to refer to not just the prestige of internet access, but instead to the fluency with which some young women nimbly negotiate the moral challenges gender scrutiny, and social surveillance that they encounter online. Krapia and Mualima officials view students as being at risk of being drawn away from the ethical milieu of the school and into the morally ambiguous, nebulous space of the internet. I argue, however, that young women who cultivate a digital edge over their peers have the media savvy needed to take advantage of online resources while maintaining the socially recognized bounds of propriety and the ethical training of the school. So in this context, where knowledge of and access to digital media are both regulatory and emancipatory, young women participate in youth-associated cosmopolitan pop culture and leisure activities in strategic ways aimed at obtaining an aura of cool. On the shifting landscape of public Islam in Indonesia, I suggest that this edginess and media fluency paired with a strong religious education creates new spaces for young women to claim religious authority over peers and even parents. The moral strategies that students and recent alumni employ as they navigate new digital worlds demonstrate the ways in which young women respond to, modify, and take up certain messages about morality, class, and digital media from their schools. Young women's social practices online are not adequately or most appropriately characterized as resistance to the ethical instruction of institutions um, or, and families. Uh, rather, their participation in a moral custodianship between peers, um, or in their moral custodianship between peers, young women's individual and collective moral efforts illustrate how uh, a gentile capacity is also performed in the multiple ways in which one inhabits norms, to draw from the work of Sabah Mahmud, um, and the reassurance and recognition that one may find within them. 
After all, mastery of systems of knowledge, religious guidelines, and gender norms can be deeply fulfilling and even powerful in its own right, bringing social recognition, gendered authority, and access to networks of support. Now a little bit more about the background of these schools. Um, Mu'alimat and Krapiak are affiliated respectively with the two Muslim, or with the mass Muslim social welfare organizations, the Muhammadiyah with 25 million members approximately, and the Nahdul Ulama or NU with some 35 to 40 million members. The two organizations come from different Islamic legal, pedagogical, and epistemological backgrounds. The former is modernist and the latter is traditionalist. These two organizations were key players in Indonesia's independence efforts and have long been seen as two pillars of Indonesian Islam, um, drawing from Fahrad and Madinye. Um, though this has changed in recent years with the emergence of prominent and influential conservative and radical organizations in the country. Now schools have for a long time in Indonesia been the front line of growing conservatism among Muslim youth, uh, reflecting the macro level conservative turn in the broader political arena and society. Um, this has been the case more for state schools than it has been for private schools like the ones that I'm talking about today. Um, but by way of an example here, this photo went viral in the summer of 2019, and it shows students from a state Islamic high school waving the Tawheed flags at orientation. Um, the Tawheed flags are associated with the banned transnational Islamist group Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia, or HTI, um, as well as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS. Um, this photo raised national concerns about radicalization in public schools. Um, although this is a post about it on Instagram from a more conservative preacher himself. Okay, I can come back to. Okay, so that's a little bit about the broader context of sort of what's going on in schools. Um, a little bit about sort of what it looks like in these schools in terms of their moral and ethical training. Um, at Mu'alimat and Krapyak, girls are kept on an exhausting schedule of classes, Islamic textual analysis, leadership training, etiquette lessons, and extracurricular activities that keep them preoccupied from before sunrise until well into the evening. A busy schedule is seen as an important disciplinary tool, one that keeps the student immersed in the ethical training of the institution um, and keeps them out of trouble because often they're so, the argument is they're so tired after classes that they'll just sleep rather than getting into trouble. Uh, they do often sleep between classes. Um, so during the regular school period at Mualimat, MP3 players, personal cell phones, laptops, and other devices are expressly forbidden. At Krapyak, students' own devices were sent home with parents and guardians at the start of the semester. Um, students are, however, allowed access to a shared dorm cell phone to keep in touch with their families. And this photo um, from 2013, so cell phones have been updated a little bit since this, but uh, in this photo we see a student texting her family on a cell phone that she shares with about 75 of her dorm mates. So you can imagine trying to communicate to, with all these parents um, on just this one cell phone. So these uh, restrictions reflect the school's efforts to insulate students from the temptations of morally suspect popular culture and the possibility of dangerous distractions. As one guy uh, warned parents of the incoming class in 2019, if you send your child to school with a cell phone, the first time we catch her, we'll send the phone back to you. The second time we catch her, we'll just return your child. Um, so at both Krapyak and Walimat, moral instruction on the dangers of digital media revolved uh, closely around what the internet and cell phones might lead to, namely unsupervised encounters with the opposite sex. In interviews, parents and educators often emphasize the greater importance of sheltering girls from negative influences than boys, suggesting that exposure to sexual or violent content um, that they were not yet ready or belum siap uh, to handle could be deeply damaging to young women. Dorm supervisors at Krapik and Walimat carry out regular raids on students' uh, dorm rooms to confiscate contraband electronic gadgets as well uh, to kind of keep these, these regulations going. Um, and it's important to know that these sorts of rules are not limited to Islamic boarding schools, but also often to day schools. So on another post from 2019 was a video that went viral on Facebook depicting an Indonesian state Islamic day school principal hammer in hand dramatically smashing dozens of confiscated cell phones in front of an assembled crowd of uniformed madrasa students. So again, stories and regulations like these illustrate how educators and parents' concerns about digital media stem from their perceived morally perilous and socially corrupting nature. 
Um, and these messages reflect, again, broader social debates in Indonesia that are happening about gender, morality, and mediatization. For example, the expansive Islamic self-help section in Indonesian bookstores um, has seen the emergence of advice books on how to navigate the internet in ways that don't conflict with your piety efforts. So this book here, um, Amalan Hangus Gara Gara Status, which roughly translates to Status Update Undoes Good Deeds, which came out in 2018, um, is one such title which caters to young adults like students from Islamic schools or state schools. Um, so with colorful illustrations, eye-catching graphics, Quranic excerpts, and sample hadith, or sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, the book offers instructions on how to avoid ri'ah, or showing off of one's piety and religious acts. Although the book begins by addressing a general audience, the latter half turns to women readers, emphasizing not only their risk of overexposure through images of themselves, but the danger of them succumbing to haughtiness and arrogance through boastful posts. Men, on the other hand, it's important to note, are offered no similar warning, and in fact, the book has no uh, gender-specific advice for men at all. So if we return to the schools here, um, at Mu'alimat, a central focus of the moral instruction around digital media was the idea that the internet is a virtual public space and is fraught with all the moral dangers associated with uh, sort of being in public. During a special Ramadan assembly at Mualimat, a local professional motivational lecturer, Bu Vicky, lectured on the importance of appropriate Islamic dress for girls, especially when they're out in public, where they are representatives of their school. She warned students that the internet is a public space too, one where girls must be particularly careful to monitor their self-image and cautious about how much they reveal. She went so far as to chide girls for using the caps lock function, or excessive exclamation points when writing online, explaining that it's not very becoming for a Muslim young lady to appear as if she were angry and yelling. Um, in a related incident, I witnessed a dormitory supervisor reprimanding three middle school students for having posted pictures of themselves without their headscarves on Facebook. She said to the students, do you understand that this is the same as walking down the street without your head covered? Um, somewhat naively unaware of her privacy settings and the fact that she was Facebook friends with several Mualimat teachers, one of the guilty students turned to her friends as they left the disciplinary meeting and whispered, but how did they know? So Mu'alimat and Krapyak teachers and administrators stress the importance of girls recognizing the public nature of social media, highlighting what anthropologist Carla Jones has called the spectacularity of women's online presence, their semiotic vulnerability that is uniquely gendered. The tensions surrounding young women's internet access illustrate the double-edged nature of online practices for Muslim schoolgirls. On the one hand, many girls at Krapyak and Mu'alimat draw great pleasure from sharing images of themselves with friends and followers online. These social media networks offer access to communities, knowledge, and experiences within and beyond the Islamic boarding school. They can be spaces of mutual support and religious efforts, where girls share inspirational memes, encouraging proper practice and modesty, or reminding their peers of the rewards of religious piety. Social media posts also uh, hold this sort of promise of becoming a source of income or notoriety uh, for some young women. Um, in fact, many alumni go on to run very successful catering and baking businesses out of their homes on social media. On the other hand, social media posts make young women observable in ways that open them up to the possibility for overexposure and critique for their dress, for their perceived over-concern with their appearance, their behaviors, and their consumption practices. And we see this in this slide, which is also on the poster for the document talk today. Um, and we see this illustrated uh, where their warning, this is from the same book earlier, and it's warning uh, women the, the dangers of um, leading, social media leading to haughtiness, arrogance, and uh, being full of oneself. So the successful online performance of a pious, educated, gendered modernity, however, is how some young women achieve what I call a digital edge over their peers and even parents. I argue that these schools are actually implicitly aiding some young women in developing a digital edge so that they might be better representatives of the school and future leaders in their broader Muslim social welfare organizations. So take for example, Vicky, which we were just talking about earlier, um, and her online instructions. It's important to note that her message was not a condemnation of women's online practices or a rejection of its utility. 
Instead, her lecture involved classed messages on how to look respectable, attractive, and educated. Maybe I'm pious to that list. Her tips uh, included things like the advice for the best color combinations for your skin tone, um, most complementary patterns to pair with each other. She insisted you should never pair stripes and polka dots. Um, and she even gave tips on how to pose in such a way in photos so that you would look slimmer. Um, so in keeping with the messages of the school, Buvicki's directives were in fact guidelines on how to look your best, your, look your best, pious, educated, and modern, so that you were received as a respectable representative of the school, um, an authority uh, in the online world and in everyday life. So despite the restrictions and surveillance at the Islamic boarding schools, it's important to note that Walima and Krapyak students do find ways to access the internet and contraband gadgets. At Mualimat, one of the ways that students regularly avoided the prohibition on cell phones was to store a phone at a nearby laundromat for a small monthly fee. Um, on one occasion at Krapyak, where they did similar sort of patterns, often leaving a phone with a friend or an older sibling who went to university nearby, um, but on one occasion when a raid was expected at the dorm, several high school seniors surrounded me and put all of their cell phones into my bag as I was leaving the dormitory. So it's an, an, an accomplice. Here. Uh, so while it was not uncommon for students to bend the rules and find ways to access digital media, there were other ways that students mutually aided each other in remembering the moral guidance of the Psantan. So the shared moral mission fit with the broader socialization of the schools, which reflects this deeply influential chronic injunction to, quote, enjoin the right and forbid the wrong. At both Mu'alimat and Krapya, students often warned each other of the dangers of meeting up with boys, conveyed through stories of young women who had fallen to that fate at other schools. Um, and how that, you know, actually having done that, had brought, um, or being found out for having been with a, hanging out with a boy or communicating with a boy, um, had brought great shame uh, to the school and to the girl's family. So these are sort of cautionary tales. Um, at this point in the shared moral narratives, the girls listening would shake their heads and go, stuck from La Hazim, or seek forgiveness in Allah. So stories like these were just one of the many ways that girls kept each other in line and helped to remind their peers of the fact that their actions affected and reflected on not just themselves, but the school and their families. In this sense, the ethical socialization involves a uh, care of the self, but it's a self-care learned and sustained collaboratively through a collective and performative commitment to peers, the school, their respective Muslim social welfare organizations, and the global umat. Um, and I think this is a, a sort of idea, these sort of practices also reflect a, a concept that was developed by um, Anna Gade, this idea of technologies of community, right, through religious practice. A lot oftentimes practices um, about personal piety, in fact, create and affect the community. So on Facebook, um, or I should say, this, this sort of peer monitoring and moral support uh, took other forms as well. Uh, on Facebook, for example, girls commonly police their peers' clothing and self-presentation in their posts. It wasn't unusual to find girls leaving critical comments like, look, not malo si sis, or aren't you ashamed, sister, under a fellow Mu'alimat student's profile picture if she was not wearing her headscarf properly or if she had chosen to wear perhaps jeans and a tight long sleeve shirt. It's important to note that commentaries like these were not unlike those I regularly heard while living in and hanging out in dormitories, um, where girls often tease their peers for a form-fitting outfit or for spending too long looking in the mirror. In this way, the moral conventions of school, um, are, or the moral conventions of school, are applied to the on and offline world uh, beyond the school grounds. Now, sartorial surveillance and policing on the boundaries of propriety are, of course, an expression, in fact, of religious authority, um, an attempt to define the boundaries of religious orthodoxy. The social media experiences of young women reveal the ethical of the everyday that is uniquely gendered, a hyper-awareness of the semiotic potentials um, and pitfalls of online activity. I argue that in the online world, these seemingly mundane moments can provide young women with a digital edge to express their religious authority through posts and comments and to encourage better religious behavior, a form of dot war religious outreach, um, even as they might also be subject to increased policing and supervision by their peers and uninvited others in turn. In what follows, I'd like to turn to the case of Trini, 
who is a Mu'alimat graduate, whose successful performance of a certain, a certain ideals of Muslim femininity online help her to uh, reflect, or deflect, excuse me, deflect critique from commentators as she creates new spaces for women to discuss taboo subjects related to motherhood online. Um, her story illustrates what cultivating a digital edge both requires and facilitates for some women. So Trini was a model student during her time at Mualimat. Um, we first met in 2008 while she was still in high school. Um, after graduation, Trini went on to attend a local Muhammadiyya run university in Jakarta, where she studied to be a teacher. Fulfilling her dream to live abroad, she then went on to spend two years in Thailand where she taught at an Islamic school in the South. During that time, she ran a blog about her travels and experiences, uh, which was read widely by Mu'alimat students, teachers, and youth in the broader Muhammadiyya organization, or broader Muhammadiyya circles. Um, during my field work at Mu'alimat between 2011 and uh, 2012, Trini's name often came up when I asked about successful Mu'alimat alumna. She was summarily referred to as the one with the blog and the one who went to Thailand. So in 2019, when we sat down for an interview, Trini was in her mid-twenties and had been married for about two years to a Mu'aliman graduate, which is the brother school of Mu'alimat, which was yet another characteristic that marked her as a successful Mu'alimat graduate. The popularity of her online writing had continued, and when she gave birth to her first child, the subject of her writing turned to motherhood. Um, at first, her posts were largely about her daughter's development and often came with well-researched ideas for age-appropriate, mentally stimulating activities for babies. But the tone of Trini's posts shifted when she became pregnant with her second child and she left uh, her local teaching job to be a full-time mom. Trini's frank writing about the difficulties of this transition gained her a lot of attention online. She explained, quote, I poured my heart out, Chua on Facebook. And many who commented shared their own feelings of disappointment, fatigue, um, and boredom when being home with their, with their children all day. I complained about the challenge. My first post like this was shared by over 10,000 people. I was surprised because it wasn't a scientific post. I was just letting things out. Lots of people commented, I also feel the same. And they noted that mothers are not allowed to complain in Indonesia. If they complain, um, they're seen as not being disciplined enough in their religious practice or strong enough in their faith. Um, there's a lot of stigma against mothers expressing their dif difficulties, and they're told that they just need to be stronger." End quote. So noting this interest in acknowledging what she called mommy blues, or postpartum depression, and the challenges of motherhood, Trini joined forces with several Mu'alimat alumni to create a highly popular uh, WhatsApp support group for new moms. At the time of our interview, the group had over 200 members. Now here, um, Trini's digital edge comes not from her online, just from her online finesse, but from the way um, or from how she displays an adherence to certain ideals of piety, modernity, and femininity in her online content. She draws her authority from a combination of a strong academic background, stylish but modest pictures, a, a successful marriage to a fellow Mohammedan member, and loving notes about her family, although honest as well, right? So these qualities wrap her discussions of local uh, gender norms in the semiotic signs of respectability. Um, though they do not protect her entirely from criticism in the comment section of her posts or in her inbox. These qualities combined with her flair for writing, her well-researched online posts, and her insightful social commentary allow her the same space to care, or excuse me, allow her the space to carefully uh, test certain boundaries of the expectations of motherhood. Now, um, just briefly, I'll maybe summarize a little bit of, we're thinking about sort of how would, this is all happening within the broader context of some important changes within Indonesian education. Um, and in particular, there's been a strong emphasis with the 2013 curriculum, um, which has only now been kind of trickling down into schools. Um, there's been a really strong emphasis on um, models that are more student-centered, um, often asking students to search for information on their own. Um, rather than the kind of prescriptive pedagogical models that have long characterized Indonesian education. Um, and the important thing to know here is that students often will just Google 
uh, the topic that they're supposed to do their research on and then bring that sort of information to class. And there's often not much um, education or guidance given to them about what are good uh, sources to be drawing on from online resources. Uh, so media literacy guidelines are not a big thing in schools quite yet. Um, here we have a geographer just to, to explain our photo here. We have a geography lesson including uh, or involving Google Maps, although in this photo the teacher is actually adding me on Facebook. Um, important pedagogical moment. <laughs> um, but this is all to say that there are some shifts happening in broader education it, that often mean uh, students are online more frequently for education, often with not much guidance. Um, and this issue of digital literacy among Indonesian youth extends to the realm of religious authority as well. So in um, this edited volume, Muslim Millennial, Chatatan Dan Kisa Wow Muslim Zaman Now, or Millennial Muslim Stories and Writings That Wow Today's Young Muslims, um, so this, this, this text was very focused on this idea of religious authority in this changing digital world. Um, this edited collection uh, by Indonesian scholars, activists, and government officials addressed the online access that young Muslim children and teens have to instant answers um, to their religious questions, often bereft of the traditional processes of religious exegesis through a learned and trusted scholar. A 2016 Indonesian Internet Service Providers Association survey of internet access um, reported that of those Indonesian teens with internet access, 81% were using social media to look for social for look, to look for religious advice. Um, so for religious schools like Mu'alimat and Krapya, these changes pose potential problems for the future of the broader Muhammadiyah and Anu, respectively, as much of the information for that kids are finding online for religious advice is not coming from scholars from these organizations. Um, and U activists have made very clear efforts to warn of these issues as they relate to losing young future membership, a fact illustrated quite vividly by this book that came out in 2019 um, called Guruku Bukan Sheikh Google, Kiat uh, Selectif Menchari Guru, or My Teacher Isn't Sheikh Google, Tips for Selectively Choosing Your Teacher. Um, Efforts to discuss issues of digital literacy at Muhammadiyah, by contrast, appear to be a bit more modest and often locally rooted. Um, at Mu'alimat, for example, these efforts in digital literacy were often led by their peers, by student groups. Um, so with this in mind, um, at both schools, there were times when peers did step in to monitor the content of their friends' online posts um, when they deviated from the teachings of their school. This was particularly the case for students at Krapya, where school leadership, in fact, encouraged this kind of communal uh, custodianship. Um, an example I could talk about maybe during the Q&A um, is, I can, I can give up an example at that point. I'm running out of time, I can see. So, um, as one Nyai, or a female leader of the Pesantren, explained in 2019, whereas previously NU networks and connections with schools were maintained through annual uh, commemorative anniversary meetings on campus grounds, Social media networks are now increasingly key places for recrafting communal networks. Um, she explained to me, quote, now our alumni networks are maintained through apps like WhatsApp rather than in person often. We tell women to keep track of those who leave and to follow up with friends who don't, um, to ask why they left and to encourage, encourage them to return, end quote. So these efforts are becoming increasingly important as the rise of alternative uh, Muslim groups and preachers hold the potential to undermine the influence of long-standing Muslim social welfare organizations like Muhammadiyah and Anu. So in my final section of my presentation today, I want to consider these developments in light of the rise of media-savvy, neo-Salafi, and Islamist preachers and movements in the country. So in her work on Islamic televangelists in Egypt, anthropologist Yasmin Mole argues that the fragmentation of religious authority that correlated with the development of new media in the Muslim world did not negate the idea of authority, but instead relocated it. Quote, the legitimacy to narrate is now derived uh, not from one's mastery of the religious sciences, but through one's own personal experience and journey to a more virtuous life, end quote. So in Indonesia, these narratives of self-improvement and business acumen are common in the Hijra movement. Um, hijra here literally means movement, um, but it's referring to an internal transformation from jahiliya or ignorance, pre, you know, lacking piety, to correct religious practice. 
Um, and the Jahiliya movement, or excuse me, the Hijra movement, <laughs> um, is often described as a kind of born again Islamic cause that emphasizes a kind of neo Salafi approach to religious orthodoxy. These new preachers often present themselves as relaxed, approachable, and cosmopolitan, like Hanan Ataki here, a skateboarding enthusiast who dresses in what might be viewed as classic hipster attire, right? In particular, he wears a, a beanie rather than a traditional skull cap. Um, these preachers preach about subjects relating to everyday lives of youth, um, things like how to avoid dating, um, how to get married, and the sort of struggles of piety. However, compared to their Muhammadiyah and Anu rivals, the new preachers emphasize more restrictive understandings of women's dress and their role in public life. Um, they also emphasize or uh, portray a certain level of growing uh, intolerance, particularly towards religious minorities and LGBTQ communities. Now, some of the success of new preachers comes from their neo-Salafi message of discursive coherence in their da'wa, providing these kind of neatly packaged, creatively designed messages on matters of religion that speak to the religious needs and questions of middle-class Muslims who are newly committed to their faith and with little formal religious schooling. Um, the neo-Salafi preacher Felix Siao, with a background in marketing, is particularly good at this, and this is an example of one of the many Instagram accounts associated with him, this one associated with his daughter, actually. But very much on brand with Felix Sio as well. Um, so Joseph Carter based and U activists that I spoke to were well aware of this sort of media savvy uh, that these new preachers had. And they noted that older preachers uh, from their organization were struggling to stay up to date and kind of relevant on social media. So despite this, um, there were very clear efforts from particularly organizations like NU who are trying to combat what they see as growing conservatism and the influence of the Hydra movement in particular. Um, and their messages have been anything but subtle, really. Um, on social media and NU-affiliated websites, activists call out specific preachers like Felix Sio and others affiliated with the Hydra movement for what they see as the faults in their interpretations. In July 2019, I attended a play by Fatayat Nu, which is the Young Women's Body or branch of the Nahdul Ulama um, in Jakarta, and this was written by local Fatayat activists. In fact, one was an uh, alumna of Krapia, and the play itself was titled Islam Young Mana or Which Islam. And the content of the performance was a part of a uh, Nu's larger Prampuan dan Padamayan or Women in Peace. Um, this kind of effort to recruit women in the fight against radicalization and the spread of misinformation online. It situated NU and its female leadership in particular as the bulwark guardians of Islam in Nusantara, or Islam of the Archipelago, a motto of the NU's social efforts since 2015. So in this sense, Fateh clearly recognizes the critical edge held by young women activists and is working to harness this resource for, um, in their efforts to combat threats to their religious authority from more conservative groups in the country. So some concluding thoughts here. So like the Kiai at the start of my talk today articulated so vividly, smartphones and the digital world they hold are powerful tools. They're cutting edge, necessary, but dangerous if not handled with appropriate care or moral training. The edges can be sharper for young women than their male counterparts, as women's bodies, self-presentation, consumption practices, and piety are subject to greater surveillance and critique. Um, while on the surface, school policies at Krapiak and Mualimat appear to simply limit and restrict internet access, a closer look at the messages of moral instruction um, at these schools illustrates the ways in which these schools are actually trying to provide students the tools to successfully navigate morally murky digital terrain. Young women students who negotiate, anticipate, and perform certain elements of these gendered expectations and online pressures have a kind of digital edge over their peers. Now, Kropyak and Mu'alimat school administrators are invested in the continued influence and growth of their respective social welfare organizations, a future that largely depends on the continued youth interest and identification with their groups. Rather than view women as mere passive consumers, young women users at these schools 
are active participants in online discussions themselves, engaging and interpreting what they encounter online. While some might simply cheer uh, women's defiance of school rules as resistance to disciplinary strictures, um, my research demonstrates how examining the ways in which women actually inhabit certain norms in their, is to their strategic advantage illustrates their agentival or agential uh, capacity. Closer attention to micro-level choices and the semiotics of self-representation online reflect the potential socio-religious ramifications of their online decision-making processes. Young women's display of a digital edge serves as a kind of public enactment of expertise that grants young women the authority to weigh in on issues of modesty, piety, and religious interpretation. Ultimately, young women's everyday internet practices are about something more than just leisure. In this case, they have the potential to actively shape the broader religio-political landscape of Islam in Indonesia as critical custodians of the digital boundaries of their communities. Thank you.